by coming back to town, um, I'll just tell you a couple things about her before she uh, begins her presentation. Uh, she got her BA in philosophy from Goucher College and her MA and PhD from Villanova. Uh, she's been at Utah Valley University since 2003 where she is now associate professor and chair of the department. She's uh, authored numerous articles on topics in continental philosophy and also co-edited a couple collections, Beauvoir and the History of Philosophy from Plato to Butler, The Contradictions of Freedom, Philosophical Essays on Simone de Beauvoir's The Mandarins, and uh, tonight she will be speaking on The Unruly Origins, Patriarchy, Beauvoir, Freud, and Nietzsche. Um, so please join me in welcoming Shannon Lisa. Really, I am so happy that you all decided to come out on Friday evening to hear this. So I hope I can make it worth your time. And I will take any kind of question that you have, depending on how well you know this stuff or how well you don't. I will really just happily engage in any kind of conversation. So feel free to ask anything that comes to mind at the end of this. So this is a project that um, I have been trying to crack for a couple of years now and I just I keep going back to it and I keep getting closer and closer to what it is I think I want to say and I think I'll eventually hopefully maybe be able to turn it into a, a manuscript project so again there's a lot of uh, a lot of places that I think uh, I would like a little bit of push so please feel free to give me that push so that I can develop this further so I'll just go ahead and start in Simone de Beauvoir's magnum opus, The Second Sex, she finds herself in a serious conundrum, a problem that haunts and informs all of feminism to some extent. And this is the problem of the beginnings of patriarchy, where we all want to know, did it all begin? Is there some reason why women have been overwhelmingly placed in positions of subordination of physical, psychic, and social significance in so many cultures and for so long a time? Perhaps it is the subject matter, oppression, and subordination that makes the issue of origin so pressing in feminist theory. In any case, Beauvoir's treatment of the question often multiplies answers. That is, her own perspectivalist approach generates myriad lenses through which to view the problem. Historical materialism, psychoanalysis, history, mythology, sociology, biology, existentialism, I mean the book is just filled with different perspectives into this very problem. The sheer breadth alone of Beauvoir's approach in the second sex underscores the complexity of the origins of patriarchal culture for feminism. Yet there's always been one passage in this text that has both intrigued and irritated scholars in general and me in particular. At the beginning of her treatment of history, Beauvoir discusses early nomadic humans. The brief passage is fascinating because of its wholehearted endorsement of a Hegelian Kojevian model of self-consciousness based on violent confrontation and work, and its simultaneous uneasiness with the advent of patriarchy in an illusory and undocumented past of the species. Her story is tied to violence and domination in a way that echoes earlier treatments of the beginnings of human civilization in Nietzsche and Freud. This paper offers a reading of civilizational origins in all three thinkers with the hope of ultimately shedding light on Beauvoir's complicated and troubling analysis of human prehistory. Rejecting the idea that one must choose between a Nietzschean or a Freudian configuration of origin mythology, I argue that Beauvoir's unique approach, which emphasizes the ambiguity of lived experience, allows us to maintain both approaches to the problem of patriarchy without contradiction. And ultimately, it would be nice to say that this is just sort of a useful way of asking the question in general, not just through Beauvoir, but also just sort of asking about the question of these kinds of origins for feminist theory as such. Jacques Derrida's essay, Before the Law, provides a point of access into civilizational origins from the perspective of literature, and additionally, I believe, helps to frame the problem of the unruly origins of male civilized society. In this essay, which addresses Kafka's parable of the same name, Derrida makes a surprising detour into Freud's analysis of the murder of the primal father. Focusing on the notion of what it means to be before or the law, Derrida highlights the unusual way in which Freud discusses the beginnings of society, morality, and religion. 
In Totem and Taboo, Freud locates the origin of these major achievements of civilization in the murder and consumption of a powerful primitive father by his sons. Clearly one of the most fun stories to read in all of Western literature. For Derrida, this discussion hinges on the impossibility of the success of such a pivotal event. In fact, the sons fail in their original wish, which is to take the place of the father. As a result, Derrida maintains that this deed is essentially a useless crime, which inaugurates nothing, as the very social achievements it supposedly installs must have pre-existed the act for it to have caused the satisfaction and remorse it does. Consequently, the origin that Freud seeks in this story constantly recedes into impossibility, paralleling the prohibited access to the law in Kafka's parable, a recession that Freud otherwise staunchly rejects. In a similar way, Beauvoir's description of the male-dominated beginnings of human prehistory mostly fails to account for the inauguration of patriarchal civilization. I return to this problem below, but let me pause here to set out what I take to be the crux of the puzzle. The nature of primal consciousness, as outlined by Beauvoir, is such that it does not have a sex or gender, and yet the original confrontation between men and women is marked by sexual difference. Because self-consciousness exists in already sexed and gendered bodies, the very possibility of an original encounter is actually precluded. Women lost because they never entered into a struggle for recognition. But how does one lose a contest that never took place? The origins of patriarchy thus recede into impossibility in the very attempt to give an account of them. So returning. It's no secret that Freud's discussions of repression, memory, and the institution of the social order share striking similarities with Nietzsche's account of the history of morality and the genealogy of morals. For his part, Nietzsche too discusses the origins of the modern inheritance of guilt, morality, and the bad conscience. Although perhaps not as graphic as Freud's story of the murderous bands of brothers, murderous band of brothers, Nietzsche tells another Genesis story of what he calls, quote, the serious illness that man was bound to contract under the stress of the most fundamental change he ever experienced." End quote. Nietzsche and Freud, while sharing a number of critical similarities, diverge on one very important point. And I'm not going to say that this is an uncontestable point. So this is my reading, but some of you may have different readings with this one. Whereas Freud is bound to his Oedipal narrative so thoroughly that the origin and therefore goal of humanity is inseparable from it, Nietzsche's origin is deliberately loose, non-specific, and non-binding, such that the future can be freed from the past. Utilizing each thinker, Beauvoir addresses the origin of woman's oppression from both perspectives, rejecting the idea that she must choose between pure fiction and total determinacy. Beauvoir ambiguously maintains aspects of both. All right, so first part, origins in Nietzsche. For Nietzsche, the inability to forget is a sign of sickness. Championing active forgetfulness, he ironically undertakes a massive act of memory in order to tell the story of the beginnings of bad conscience and guilt through the internalization of outwardly directed instincts. The semi-animal predecessors of modern humans who were, quote, well adapted to the wilderness, to war, to prowling, to adventure, suddenly found their instincts devalued and suspended, end quote, by social order. This monumental event created a human being. <coughs> However, the originary event, if one can call it that, remains shrouded in mystery, such that the exact details of the transition remain unnecessary, unsaid, and probably untrue for Nietzsche. One way to approach his characterization of the elusive origins of the present state of affairs is through the examination of the four great errors from Twilight of the Idols. In all four analyses, he draws our attention to the problem of causality in general. In fact, we don't understand what a cause is, or if it can even be said to be anything at all. In the study of each error, there is a retroactive move made by thinking to posit some kind of absolute explanatory origin that justifies and alleviates a present state of physical or psychical discomfort. In particular, the error of false causality leads us down the mistaken path of supposing a mind, will, consciousness, or I undergoing and even control controlling the vicissitudes of the organism. This substantial internal world of control is actually, quote, full of optical illusions and mirages, and the eye itself is nothing more than a fable, a fiction, a play on words, end quote. As the will, ego, soul, etc., are merely de facto projections posited as a way to explain what is essentially meaningless, 
their absolute authority rests on shifting ground. Therefore, any attempt to actually find their origins in God or history, for example, will itself be a fable of fiction or a play on words. Nietzsche describes the reasoning behind this human habit. Quote, tracing something unfamiliar back to something familiar alleviates us, calms us, pacifies us, and in addition provides a feeling of power. The unfamiliar brings with it danger, unrest, and care. Our first instinct is to do away with these painful conditions. First principle, some explanation is better than none, end quote. In other words, all of our attempts to find causal principles are fictions. This inclination to invent causes to do away with pain is nothing to be ashamed of or to struggle against. Rather, the tendency to deceive ourselves into thinking that whatever meaning we attribute to any given state of affairs is in fact the single truth behind them is the most seductive danger to our psychical health. In an attempt to diagnose our contemporary sickness, Nietzsche undergoes an investigation into the origins of morality in the genealogy of morals. To accomplish this task, he takes an imaginative journey into the wildly hypothetical prehistory of humankind. Here we are introduced to the semi-animals who are forced to abandon their instincts for wilderness war and adventure in order to enter into the earliest forms of civilization. These instincts, prohibited from external release, were turned inward and accordingly began the work of soul and conscience building. Nietzsche explains that the origin of the bad conscience rested on a change that far from being gradual was, quote, a break, a leap, a compulsion, an ineluctable disaster instituted by an act of violence, end quote. This act was so sudden that it precluded resentment. The act itself implemented the first state, a fearful tyranny instituted by the most terrible and voluntary unconscious artists. Of course, the bad conscience does not begin with them, but with those whom they dominate, who are forced to repress and incarcerate their own instincts for freedom or die. The original culture was precisely this, the activity of a more powerful group of semi-animals forcibly shaping an amorphous collection of nomads into a subservient community. Well worth noting is the way Nietzsche approaches the event of this institution of culture. Quote, supposing that what is at any rate to, uh, believed to be the truth really is true, and the meaning of all culture is the reduction of the beast of prey, man, to the tame and civilized animal, a domestic animal, end quote. Notice the way in which Nietzsche disowns what he owns in one and the same breath. If we are to suppose that the truth is true, then we can accept his hypothesis. But this means that the validity of his, of his position is based on a supposition concerning a truth that isn't true in any kind of unconditional sense. The analysis of culture that Nietzsche provides for us, although penetrating and terrifyingly convincing, does not require itself to be the truth. Accordingly, the origin of cultured humankind recedes to the point of being impossible to grasp and really not what should concern us. It is the diagnosis of the present state of affairs and the possible hope for the future that commands our attention. Furthermore, these latter two projects are in fact made possible by the fact that there is no definitive event, but rather a fiction which started this whole mechanism in motion. Remember, some explanation is better than none, so long as we do not convince ourselves that it is the explanation. The recession of the origin into fantastic narrative is mirrored in Nietzsche's own examination of how the original debt to our predecessors becomes an increasing burden as the ancestral powers take on more monstrous and demanding proportions. Quote, within the original tribal community, we are speaking of primeval times, the living generation always recognized a juridical duty toward earlier generations and especially toward the earliest which founded the tribe. The conviction reigns that it is only through the sacrifices and accomplishments of the ancestors that the tribe exists, and that one has to pay them back with sacrifices and accomplishments." End quote. Part of the problem with this kind of ancestral indebtedness is the fact that they, the ancestors, don't really exist, at least not the ones who command such respect and sacrifice. As Nietzsche specifically tells us that we are dealing with primeval times, and earlier that this whole story begins with semi-animal human predecessors, there is no set figure or group to whom homage is being paid. Such a group withdraws into the fictive past, which is precisely why they maintain such power over the present. 
This is due in large part because the past is nothing more than the fiction of the present, projecting behind us the myth of an authentic ancestry. Returning to one of his primary tasks then, Nietzsche diagnoses the contemporary sickness of modernity as it putrefies under the burden of the ever-expanding effects of the bad conscience. The origin, now become God, berates and abuses us for having dared to exist at all. As a result of this initial abandonment of the animal, however and whenever it happened, the internalization of instincts blooms into a sense of unapproachable guilt. We, inter we reinterpret, quote, these animal instincts themselves as a form of guilt before God, as hostility, rebellion, insurrection against the Lord, the Father, the primal ancestor, and the origin of the world, end quote. Since the origin is retroactively instituted through the machinations of guilt, this guilt requires an ever more powerful cause to explain its increasingly insidious presence such that by the time it reaches its feverish pitches in modernity, it must necessarily be the work of an absolute origin or an omnipotent father god. Such an origin demands incessant sacrifices of an increasingly psychic kind and punishes mercilessly on a largely unconscious level. And as Nietzsche laments, quote, here is sickness beyond any doubt, the most terrible sickness that has ever raged in man, end quote. Only Nietzsche can say it like that, I swear. <laughs> All right, the second part is origins in Freud. In contrast to the active forgetfulness of Nietzsche, Freud maintains that nothing can ever be truly forgotten and thus everything is theoretically fair game in the diagnosis and alleviation of neurotic symptoms. Freud thus has an enormous amount of hope that the origins of morality and even society itself can be brought to light so long as our excavation is done carefully and thoroughly through psychoanalytic practice. Consequently, in Totem and Taboo, when Freud locates the origins of critical cultural developments in the murder of the primal father, he is confident that he has found the historical answer to three things. First, the origins of conscience. The murderous impulses of our emotional ambivalence toward our father satisfied, we are left with the remorse resulting from our now forever unrequited love of him. This remorse becomes an unconscious judgment of our desires and actions or the psychic representation of the father himself. Two, the origins of religion. The father no longer present takes on mythological power and prestige and cannot be confronted or challenged. And three, the origins of society. The brothers, originally united in crime, consequently unite in guilt over the parricide by instituting the incest and murder taboos. Far into this narrative on the function of totemic thoughts and taboos, Freud launches into the story of their origins uniting the psychoanalytic treatment of totemism with the Darwinian description of the earliest human societies, a seemingly fantastic explanation emerges. One day, a band of brothers joined up to destroy their violent and jealous father, a task impossible for any of them to do alone. Originally filled with the ambivalent emotions of love and hatred of their father, his death satisfies their aggression toward him, leaving their remaining affection without an object. This abandoned erotic attachment is transformed into remorse and a sense of guilt. Prohibiting the killing of the newly erected father substitute in the guise of the totem animal, as well as denying themselves immediate sexual relations with the women of the group, the two cornerstones of civilization are erected by this single act, the prohibitions against murder and incest. Not surprisingly, these two prohibitions, quote, inevitably corresponded to the two repressed wishes of the Oedipus complex, end quote. Yeah. Freud has neatly accomplished what he set out to do. Provide us with a hypothesis, quote, which may seem fantastic, but which offers the advantage of establishing an unsuspected correlation between groups of phenomena that have hitherto been disconnected, end quote. In short, Freud has found an origin capable of explaining otherwise heterogeneous phenomena. Significantly, Freud's confidence in the story is total. And that even if this episode never took place in reality, if it's not a historical fact, it's still a historical truth. Quote, the mere hostile impulse against the father, the mere existence of a wishful fantasy of killing and devouring him, would have been enough to produce the moral reaction that created totemism and taboo, end quote. By anchoring the emergence of humanity to the Oedipal murder, Freud provides a diagnosis of the sickness caused by the descendants of the Oedipal complex. 
Guilt emerges from our ties to the original parasite, either in wish or in fact. In any event, the guilt is inevitable and binding, born as it is of a violent act. In Civilization and Its Discontents, Freud returns to the thematic of the primal murder. Given that this is one of his final works on the issue, it reinforces the importance of the event in the development of the superego and the accompanying feelings of individual and social guilt. Again, Freud tells us that it does not matter whether or not the actual murder and consumption of the father happened. All that matters is that even the fantasy is enough to institute the critical feelings of remorse. Quote, whether one has killed one's father or has abstained from doing so is not really the decisive thing. One is bound to feel guilty in either case. This conflict is set going as soon as men are faced with the task of living together. So long as the community assumes no other form than that of the family, the conflict is bound to express itself in the Oedipus complex, to establish the conscience and to create the first sense of guilt." End quote. Initially, it appears that Freud is arguing along the same lines as Nietzsche. It doesn't really matter if this event took place. What matters is the way that the present and its attendant structures of reality can be diagnosed by our relationship to the past. Our primary sense of ambivalence towards our fathers is enough that we will inevitably love him and wish to replace him. However, while managing to escape the inevitability of the event, it's like a historical actual event, Freud anchors himself to a different kind of origin, the form of the family and its attendant edible drama, certainly but more importantly to the primary emotional ambivalence experienced in this family. Civilization is defined by this structure. Indeed, the heart of the dilemma lies in the fact that it is not really important whether or not the murder occurred. Rather, the significance is found in how we live under the crushing weight of an omniscient superego that punishes us ruthlessly whether we actually act or merely fantasize about it. Regardless of the murder's reality, Freud insists that his conclusion, which shows, quote, that the beginnings of religion, morals, society, and art converge in the Oedipus complex, is sound and irrefutable. It is not the act that is necessary, but the primacy of the mythic father and our ambivalent relationship toward him that is. Whether the event happened or not, or we only wish that it did, there is no escape from this origin. Despite the fact that Freud seems open to escape, rarely does he indicate it is possible in civilization. And whereas Nietzsche would embrace this possibility to be rid of the declining and putrefying structures of modernity, Freud, who also bemoans the contemporary state of cultural neurosis, has little hope in a new kind of humanity. And I know some people do, like Elizabeth Ruttenberg argues that, in fact, he did have more hope about the possibility of overcoming the sort of drive of Thanatos that's destroying everything in civilization, but I don't see it so much. In the future of an illusion, Freud claims that it is possible to imagine a reordering of human relationships in society such that the great weight of violent coercion and instinctual suppression could be abandoned. However, he quickly notes that every civilization requires these forces in order to exist. Thus, it is not a matter of imagining a totally new way of living, but rather quite, rather quote, the decisive question is whether and to what extent is it possible to lessen the burden of the instinctual sacrifices imposed on men, to reconcile men to those which must necessarily remain, and to provide a compensation for them, end quote. In other words, the task upon us is not to formulate a totally new kind of society, but to modify the existing social structures such that they are as painless as possible. Human identity is, so anchored, is anchored so profoundly to its edible roots that in the end it cannot be divorced from them. At best, we can imagine a time when we understand the necessity of renouncing our drives and thus submit to them freely. Third section, origins in Beauvoir. Turning now to the thorny question of the origins of patriarchy in Beauvoir requires that we pause and take account of significant factors in our preceding discussion. Regardless of their differences concerning the origins of society, both Freud and Nietzsche posit violent and murderous beginnings that either forget the place of women entirely, as we find in Nietzsche, or simply reduce them to the property of treacherous children, as we find in Freud. At no point does either author question the necessity of violence as an obvious masculine privilege when talking about origins. Whatever happened, or whatever we wish to have happened as we entered into human being, happened between men. The influence of Freud and Nietzsche on Beauvoir's work differs by text, and thus I focus only on how their theories appear in the second sex. Although Freud figures most prominently in her critiques of his overemphasis on the libido and for his depictions of female sexuality along the lines of a truncated and castrated man, 
he yet remains a positive influence in many ways. Perhaps this is due to her own respect and utilization of Levi Strauss's structural anthropology, particularly as found in the elementary structures of kinship. Her use of Nietzsche, while perhaps more laudatory, is also more difficult to tease out insofar as it infuses her existential framework as such. In any event, the question of civilizational origins is central to her own discussion of the beginnings of patriarchal forms of power in this work, and thus the preceding analyses may shed some light to her approach here. The question I pose in the following is deceptively simple. Is the origin of patriarchy in Beauvoir Nietzschean, insofar as it remains unconcerned with the determinate beginning, or is it Freudian, insofar as it is marked by an event in wish or in fact in its institution? The beginning of the history chapter in the second sex opens with an air of confidence and certainty. Quote, this world has always belonged to males and none of the reasons given for this have ever seemed sufficient. By reviewing prehistoric and ethnographic data in light of existentialist philosophy, we can understand how the hierarchy of the sexes came to be. Wow. Would that such an accomplishment were possible. We'd be done. We wouldn't have to argue anymore. This is an incredible claim from the philosopher who also acknowledges in the introduction that nothing happened that could explain women's subservient role. Their, quote, dependence is not the consequence of an event or a becoming. It did not happen. Alterity here appears to be an absolute, partly because it falls outside the accidental nature of historical fact. A situation created over time can come undone at another time, end quote. How can we understand how something comes to be if it did not happen, if it somehow lies outside of time? In the cases of American slavery, the Jewish diaspora or colonialization, the oppressed shared a before in time, place, religion, or culture, which grounds them and serves as a reference point in the struggle for liberation. This, it would seem, would allow the origins of patriarchy to be relatively loose and unbinding in the Nietzschean sense. There was no event, therefore we can move from there. It is before argues, quote, the tie that binds woman to her oppressors is unlike any other, and that is a biological given rather than a historical moment. Quote, their opposition took place within an original mitzvah, and she has not broken it. The couple is a fundamental unit with the two halves riveted to each other. Cleavage of society by sex is not possible. This is the fundamental characteristic of woman. She is the other at the heart of a whole whose two components are necessary to each other. Although there was no event that caused her oppression, she is more tightly bound to her subservient position because she forms an unbreakable, even ontological unit with her oppressor. Beauvoir admits that ethnology provides us with what she calls extremely contradictory information. We don't know how women figured in the earliest forms of society. We don't know if she was physically weaker than her male counterpart in any meaningful sense, or if she was any less warlike. And yet, Beauvoir believes that in all likelihood, Woman was physically handicapped. Those are actually words she uses quite a bit. Insofar as she did not have the advantages of physical force, and much more importantly, she was heavily burdened by menstruation, pregnancy, and nursing. Retreating from her earlier claims that women were physically more or less on par with their male counterparts, Bavar sings a different tune when she addresses the handicap of reproduction caused by another term of hers, the absurd fertility of the female body. Perhaps, then, the cause of patriarchy lies in the disadvantages caused by women's reproductive bodies. Certainly, she wouldn't be the first one to say that. Certainly, by the time she moves to discuss early agricultural societies, Beauvoir is brash enough to assert, quote, from the origins of humanity, their biological privilege enabled men to affirm themselves alone as sovereign subjects. They never abdicated this privilege, end quote. Women passively undergoing monthly, monthly menstruation and mostly unwanted pregnancies, forced to care for children for whom she feels general indifference, becomes locked into repetition and imminence. However, the case of prehistoric man is radically different. He transcends to the invention and utilization of tools through which, quote, he annexes the world itself. To maintain himself, he creates. He spills over the present and opens up the future. He has not only worked to preserve the given world, he has burst its borders. He has laid the ground for a new future, end quote. 
Whereas woman suffers the endless repetition of the various cycles of reproduction and the domestic duties that are amenable to these functions, such as housework, food preparation, cleaning, and such, men break forth from the given world into a new future through invention and struggle. And here we find a repetition of a significant element in both Nietzsche and Freud's own origin stories. Violence, domination, and death carried out by man while woman is relatively sidelined. At the birth of civilization, man experienced the intoxicating thrill of violence and environmental domination that gave him a critical advantage over his female count companion. Quote, his activity has another dimension that endows him with supreme dignity. It is often dangerous. If blood were only a food, it would not be worth more than milk. But the hunter is not a butcher. He runs risks in the struggle against wild animals. The warrior risks his own life to raise the prestige of the horde, his clan. This is how he brilliantly proves that life is not the supreme value for man, but that it must serve ends far greater than itself. The worst curse on woman is her exclusion from warrior expeditions. It is not in giving life, but in risking his life that man raises himself above the animal. This is why throughout humanity, superiority has been granted not to the sex that gives birth, but to the one that kills." End quote. While it may not be physiologically obvious to Beauvoir that woman was physically weaker than man, she believes that she was overwhelmed by the tyranny of her reproductive cycles. Such an extreme disadvantage forced her into the role of maintainer of life rather than taker of life. Beauvoir claims that woman's, quote, misfortune is to have been biologically destined to repeat life, end quote. Through bloody and violent acts of transcendence, on the other hand, man asserted himself as sovereign subject, and woman agreed to this arrangement in order to procure protection during her most vulnerable times. The puzzle becomes even more complicated when we follow Beauvoir into her opening gambit, reading anthropological data through an existential framework. This requires largely that we accept her Hegelian formulation of the master-slave dialectic and consciousness formation, where a human being is shaped by the desire to impose sovereignty on the other. Since this struggle for domination marks human development so deeply, Beauvoir asks, quote, how did this whole story begin? It is understandable that the duality of the sexes, like all duality, be expressed in conflict. It is understandable that if one of the two succeeded in imposing its superiority, it had to establish itself as absolute, end quote. But why did men win from the beginning when there was never a battle waged for superiority? Continuing in the discussion of nomadic societies, Beauvoir maintains, quote, certain passages where Hegel's dialectic describes the relationship of master to slave would apply far better to the relationship of man to woman. The master's privilege, he states, arises from the affirmation of spirit over life in the fact of risking his life. But woman is originally an existent who gives life and who does not risk her life. There has never been a combat between the male and her. Hegel's definition applies singularly to her." End quote. So which is it? Was there an event or not? Is there an origin to patriarchy or not? To be fair, the entirety of the two-volume work is partially an attempt to answer the perplexing question of civilization's patriarchal origins. And where it fails to give an answer, it succeeds in giving multiple perspectives and partial answers. Still, the issue of the origin of patriarchy dogs the analyses. Put differently, the issue of what happened remains a central problem throughout the second sex. As it turns out, the answer will be nothing. There was no temporal event. And we can see this confirmed by how she locates the important factor in the institution of patriarchy, not as a historical occurrence where men gained control over women and forced them into millennial of, a millennia of submission. Rather, the institution of patriarchy emerges from the structures of human consciousness as such, which cannot in any concrete way be tied to a particular moment or really a particular sex or gender. They are rooted for Beauvoir in the fundamental opposition of human consciousnesses each seeking to be recognized by the other. Yet, although men and women share identical structures of consciousness, they experience grossly unequal embodiments. As a result, an insurmountable disadvantage for women, for women results. Patriarchy arises through violence with the terms set before they even appear as terms. Women lost the battle because there was no battle. There 
There was no battle, not because men and women didn't share the same structures of consciousness and need for recognition, but because women's physiology somehow interfered with the staging of the conflict. The structures of consciousness are violent, confrontational, and require opposition and self-definition. But their enslavement to the species prevents women from enacting these structures fully, thus placing them at some impossible time in the past in a more or less permanent place of subordination, at least until relatively recently. This is indeed a profoundly depressing and strangely masculine vision of the place of women in history. And yet, precisely because there was no historical event, it leads Beauvoir to a relatively easy move into liberation. Since women don't actually have to overthrow their male oppressors in the way that a historically enslaved people must, we can more or less shrug off the biological disadvantages of women in the modern era and institute a new, gender-neutral existential mechanism of subject formation. No longer forced to carry the burden of being man's other, woman can create a new future. Now for the conclusion. Nietzsche hypothesizes that as the Christian God has, become, is, has been the greatest God thus far achieved in humankind, and consequently the cause of the most guilt and sickness, so will its destruction result in the greatest possibilities for healthfulness. He proposes that, quote, the victory of atheism might free mankind of this whole feeling of guilty indebtedness toward its origin, its causa prima. Atheism and a kind of second innocence belong together, end quote. Clearly then, atheism frees us from the monstrous and impossible debt to our ancestors now become God. But on a deeper level, we find that atheism also opens us up to the artificiality of origins in general. Thus we find that it is in no way necessary that the original violent story be true. Rather, we learn that in telling the story, we actually create the origin. If the origin is a fiction, then we are free to imagine other origins and also seemingly impossible futures. Unfettered by the determination of a historical arche, we can even imagine a character like Zarathustra or the lonely artistic overman. Freud, also a steadfast advocate of atheism, does not, however, maintain much hope in the second innocence and healthfulness accessible to civilized humanity. Quite simply, regardless of whatever form he takes, one can never be rid of the father and the ambivalent love and hatred we feel toward him. Time and again, Freud vacillates between an absolute adherence to the structures of childhood development and the possibility of conceiving a new way of being. In the end, however, whenever Freud imagines a different future, it is always with reference to the set wishes, relationships, and traumas of childhood. Perhaps we can mature past them, perhaps we cannot, but we must, we must always begin with them. As with Freud and Nietzsche, Beauvoir's atheism plays a role in her diagnosis of the sickness of culture and its potential cure, but more because of the way that the patriarchy, that patriarchy bolsters itself by projecting masculine authority into the untouchable realm of divine right. But even this move does not do nearly enough to explain the origins of oppression. What then to do with Beauvoir's own mythic origin story that is also indebted to masculine beings who fought violently and carved out their, and therefore our, world? The primal nomads dotting the philosophical landscape of her study never existed in any real sense except in her anthropological reconstruction of them, and yet, there seems to be something in the ferocious acts of Hegelian transcendence that forms a critical, even essential component in the emergence of patriarchy. The necessary hostility of consciousness and her continual references to female biological disadvantage fastens her analysis in much the same way that Freud's murder of the father, real or psychic, fastens his. Yet the wildly and self-consciously hypothetical setup of the historical conditions of the rise of patriarchy borne out by the multiple perspectives through which she interrogates the problem, allows her freedom to imagine a different kind of society. One in which men and women both accept the ambiguity of flesh and spirit. Once we acknowledge the ambiguity of existence, we can cease trying to either force ourselves entirely from the past or passively submitting, free ourselves entirely from the past or passively submitting to its yoke. Men and women could thus reconceive their relationship to each other and to the social structures that they form and which form them. Quote, in these combats where they believe they are tackling each other, they are fighting their own self, projecting onto their partner the part of themselves they repudiate, instead of living the ambiguity of their condition. 
Each one tries to make the other accept the objection of this condition and reserves the honor of it for oneself. If, however, both assumed it with lucid modesty as the correlate of authentic pride, they would recognize each other as peers and live the erotic drama in harmony." End quote. If the Gordian knot of patriarchal culture is loosened by the acceptance of our ambiguity, then perhaps we should adopt the same approach regarding its origins. This would help make more palatable not only Beauvoir's emphatic claims about women's reproductive handicaps, but also the un uncomfortable adoption of psychic and physical violence that marks human transcendence. By refusing to overcome or solve our ambiguous beginnings, we can maintain the free-floating origins of Nietzsche's genealogical analysis, which opens us up to future possibilities untethered to our mythic past, as well as the determining structures of Freud's narrative, which provides us with precious tools to evaluate practices and thought and action so long-standing that we might as well consider them essential structures of consciousness and culture, all the while refusing to swear allegiance to either. In this way, we can op occupy the space of ambiguity so difficult to maintain, but so vital for ethical existence and critical reflection. Thank you. We do have time for questions, but um, as people formulate their questions, um, I neglected to let uh, Dr. Tyson uh, make an me. announcement. Um, Philosophy Club's going to have its first meeting on Monday, and um, it's going to be in Infinitus Pi, which is apparently in the Tivoli and sounds like a perfect place to have <laughs> Philosophy <laughs> Club. Um, it's going to be at 5 p.m. If you have any questions about it, please ask me after. Thanks, Robert. Now you have plenty of time to think of a question. <laughs> Um, this is a really exciting project um, and really fun to listen to. I, the way that you narrate Freud and Nietzsche in particular is really exciting. I like how you present them very much. So I just think this is very exciting. I can't wait to see it in book form. Um, I think I, my question is about Moses and monotheism. Okay. Because I'm worried about the structure of trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just going like, to kind of throw this at you and see what you think. Sure. That it seems like um, the killing of Moses creates this like, the thing about that is, is you don't live through it the first time. You can only live through it as traumatic repetition. Right. Right. And Freud's saying something about the structure of history. Right. And that seems why he's so bound to um, like traumatic origin, right? Because because uh, trauma is not what you experience, but precisely what you could not experience in the incident itself, in right. the train wreck or whatever it is. Right. It's six weeks later that you begin to mm -hmm. repeat it, mm -hmm. and I I just wonder how that like that Beauvoir keeps coming back to this problem in different repetitions. Right. They're different, but she's still repeating the problem of the origin of patriarchy as like a traumatic origin. But as she says, unlike American chattel slavery, right. the working through doesn't seem as obvious to yeah. it. Well, mm -hmm. uh, as though, the, sorry, the working through of American chattel slavery doesn't seem obvious, but it <laughs> seems like we have a historical narrative by which to think through, to reconstruct our narratives about it. Mm -hmm. But with this one, it's sort of like, it just recedes precisely because we weren't there to experience the very thing she being. Right. Consciousness. I mean, really, the way you said it is precisely how I, is what I think is going on. So the fact that you're bringing up that repetition of the trauma that you yeah. could, that, in a certain sense, I mean, even with, with, with like the train, right, there, there is some kind of trauma. And with, with Moses being killed, yeah. that didn't happen, right? Even though we're reliving that trauma in some kind of, in these echoes, and we're basically recreating, we're creating it by reliving it, even though it never really mm -hmm. happened. And I think that that's precisely what she's doing. She's doing the same kind of movement. In fact, as you probably know, Moses and monotheism is, is other than the three essays of sexuality, that's the one that she really gloms onto in the second right. sex, right? So she, she's, I think, adopting that kind of, yeah. of, that, of that traumatic repetition without a definitive origin right from Freud. And that's, that's problematic. I mean, I, I think Freud has 
he's kind of right in certain ways that whether or not something happened or whether or not we're imagining that something happened, we're left with this, this almost, this basically universal experience and he's finding in all of these patients that he's treating. Mm -hmm. And so it might as well have happened because it's everywhere and we can trace it all the way back to before a time we can even trace things back to. And I think that that's useful. You know, it's not just here's a fiction and here's a fiction and we can choose any kind of fiction, which I think Deleuze and Guattari are right about Nietzsche. You really can, right, Nietzsche's just kind of, oh, we can start over here and oh, we'll start over here and it's all, I'm just trying to show you that we're creating the present by these fictional yeah. stories of the past. But Freud's saying actually the present is repeating something that may have happened, may not have happened, but it might as well have happened. And so, I mean, it's useful to look at it from both perspectives. It's useful to sort of say, this structure might as well actually be a determining structure of our experience because we can't seem to shake it. This patriarchal, a violent sort of uh, consciousness formation might as well just sort of be the way human beings are because we just can't seem to get out of it at least not without existentialism, of course, right? Um, but also, it's really useful to say, you know what, forget it. We can move past it. We can, friendship and generosity, we're now in the modern age where we don't really have to worry about uh, disadvantages on bodies because we can use technology to support it. So we're just gonna let all that go and just tell ourselves a new fiction and invent a new, a new beginning. And so it's, you know, I think it's both going on and that's sort of what I like about her approach. Yeah. So. Thanks. Well, thank you. That was a really, good, really great question. Anyone else? You can ask me anything, seriously. <laughs> 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 I've got an anything for you. Um, fascinating topic. Um, I don't have anywhere near the philosophical grounding that you have. It's an interesting topic. You must have some sense as to how this might unwind in the future. <laughs> and, that, you know, looking more than a year or two ahead is always fraught with peril, danger, and we're usually wrong. <laughs> but there are things that are going on. I yeah. mean, uh, the manufacturing base in this country is crumbling. White workers who are, you know, a large number of us are now detached from these good paying jobs. You have um, African American families with a misprison of massive numbers of males. The evidence strength of females in these families as caregivers. Um, what's going on in education? How our colleges are being more and more populated by women as opposed <coughs> to men. Transformation of our economy to service oriented jobs that don't require the so called strength and mechanical capacities of men, which is probably a myth. What, how does this right. entanglement tie into what you are thinking? Or Ooh, all right. I'll, I'll watch what I say next time. <laughs> no, that's, that's really, I mean, it's a big and beautiful question. Let me see if I can take a stab at it. Um, so thing, as, soon as, you, as soon as you sort of locate a, a problem and you start to talk about it and you think that you've started to, to crack it and figure it out, something like patriarchy, right? This is feminism wants to sort of figure out either how it started or where, what status it is right now or whether or not it can be undone or whether we have in fact undone it. But it also can, can morph and it can change. And so I think what you're, right, so the, the, the thing that you're, you're diagnosing, this problem, for example, maybe um, if I call these violent interactions between people, like we need this sort of violence in order for us to establish our identity and I'm saying that's a really masculine way of looking at it, but that may not necessarily be always a masculine formation. It can morph and no longer be something that is held by, say, men or male bodies or people who occupy male positions of power. It can morph into other forms of power and other ways of abusing that, that other, other bodies and other people can occupy. Mm -hmm. And so you could still have the same fundamental problem that, I, that I'm saying inhabits patriarchal forms of consciousness and societies, but not necessarily having it be a men versus women issue. And what you may be sort of pointing to is how that morphing is taking place, right? 
well, women are occupying more positions of power, and women are occupying the university, and doesn't this, you know, and, and sort of maybe s typical positions and manufacturing and things that, that have been held by men are no longer there, and they're being imprisoned, doesn't that kind of show that... There's also s slow steps towards, very slow steps, uneven steps towards reproductive free, free right. as well. I mean, right, exactly. And so, and you know, I am, I'm never going to be that, I'm never going to say that we have not made tremendous strides and good things have, have not, have very, a lot of good things have really happened. I mean, you just look around here and you're like, well, look at all this diverse group of people sitting in here talking about philosophy, strides have been made. And it's, and it's primarily through asking sets of questions like Beauvoir and Freud and Nietzsche ask. But I think that it's still useful to sort of use that feminist lens and sort of say, is the same, are the same problems being reproduced even if they're taking on different, different structures? And I think, yes, they are. And it's useful then to sort of say, how can we look at this and this particular problem and magnify it over maybe other, other social problems? Yeah. Um, so this is sort of a De Beauvoir 101 question. Um, are there anywhere in her writings, or maybe even in Freud's, where um, what is looked at is um, matriarchal culture mm -hmm. and the stories of matriarchy that tend to repeat? And is there any analysis done comparing the stories that repeat in matriarchy mm -hmm. to those that repeat in patriarchy? Uh, yeah, so before, <laughs> when she does her analysis of angles, she says, yeah, the whole idea of, of, of there ever being this, this time of, of matriarchal culture is a complete myth. So she doesn't buy into it at all. And she says, even in the times of matriarchal cultures, she says these, were, these are largely sort of early agricultural societies. And she may, I'm not saying she's right, but she makes the argument that that was basically men were sort of afraid of the mystery of, of how seeds germinated and how everything sort of worked when they were just starting to put together agriculture and so they attributed all these unknown processes mm -hmm. to these unknown beings with their weird menstruations and their cycles and their having babies that came from seemingly nowhere and just sort of said well if we sort of worship or we praise the feminine which is mysterious then we'll be able to sort of uh, bolster up our chances with these mysterious agricultural processes and that way you know we'll be able to, to progress and to survive and, and, and such but she says that was power that was always owned by the men and they gave it to women sort of put them up on a pedestal and said ooh like the earth is is bringing forth crops so is the feminine body bringing forth crops and then they took it away so it was never really real, in other words. So, um, so then th her understanding is that there has never been a genuinely matriarchal culture. That's what she would say. In all the anthropology she's looked yeah. at. So there's nothing, there's no other story to tell. She, well, she would, she would say there are matriarchal, what we would call matriarchal cultures, but she would say that that would not be evidence that women had that power. They were being given that power to be a matriarchal society by men. I know, look at you gotta admit that at a certain point she has a very masculine perspective on these kinds of things. But she was also dealing with what she had available to her at that time as far as anthropological and ethnographic data, so. But yeah, I mean, she has a very strong line. Women have never held power. Anytime you could find an example of women holding power, it was, uh, either so so off the charts as to not even really be counted or it was it's just an example of men giving them that power because men are afraid of the world and so they make whatever they're afraid of the feminine other yeah I agree <laughs> <laughs> well what is the what is the it so in a matriarchal culture um, yeah she says you know when people try so that like, you know the Greeks with the holy road where they always would <laughs> go drop off all those treasures and whatever so because the, the whole idea was um, to control your world by uh, you know making the best bet to the gods so it's really lip service it doesn't really matter yeah that you yes that's what she would say she would say you know being held up on a pedestal and being worshipped and sort of saying that that you are more you know you're more special is just another way of saying somebody's the other 
right? It's, you know, one is I can call you the other and I can enslave you and I can force you to do things and I can suppress you. And the other one is you're so wonderful as to be untouchable and as to be magical and we owe you this, but it's still not women doing that to themselves or asserting them, asserting that in society, it's men doing that to women, right? So it might be a better place to be in some ways, but it's not, it's still not free self-determination. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that evident shift towards fundamental religious belief is somehow an artifact of man trying to reverse some of the trends that are taking place? So do, like re-subduing women? Um, yeah. I mean, so she would, right, so with the rise of monotheism, that's what she would say. No, I mean, very recently. Oh, so no, I don't guess I don't know. What do you mean? Well, we're seeing a lot of evidence of this increasing fundamentalism in religion. I mean, religiosity seems to be, in some ways, moving in a direction that kind of makes me think that men maybe somehow feel that they're losing the battle somewhere along the line of ways I expressed before. This is a way of turning the tide back towards family and the role of the man. And well, I mean, it's really, so I'm in Utah, and um, no, the, <laughs> I mean, you're, you're going to throw that out there. Um, so, um, no, I didn't over the, well, over the, no, I don't, no, I'm just saying with recent developments in, in religions and how they sort of push back against these kinds of things, and one of the, one of the hot topics that's going on in Utah right now is the, uh, whether women can be priesthood holders in the Mormon faith. So um, all men have the opportunity at a certain age, like young teenagers, like 15 or something, to be able to become priest holders in the church, and that confers all sorts of special privileges. Uh, you, you know, gives you access into religion in ways that not necessarily, you know, are, are not shared by everyone. And so there's a movement in the church, and it's, it's a minority of women. It's certainly not the majority of women. But there is a strongly voiced minority of women who are saying, well, we want to be priests too. It's very similar to some of the arguments that take place in the Catholic Church, right? Well, why can't there be female priests in the Catholic Church? Um, and the response has been very interesting because basically the church just sort of said no. <laughs> we're just not. We're just no. We're not gonna. We're not gonna entertain this, and which was kind of a strange move because. It, I think it would have been probably to their own advantage to maybe be just a little bit more uh, open to listening to the claim and just sort of say, well, we'll just listen indefinitely. But instead they said, no, our decision is absolutely not. And it's sort of the digging in heels and the reasserting of uh, patriarchal power and sort of saying, that's really nice, but really we don't want you to go too far with these very dangerous feminist ideals. And they're excommunicating women who are running it, and they're you know they're coming out pretty strong, yeah. So I think that that tends to be a move that gets enacted when um, uh, patriarchal religion is challenged by its members. And there's my example. Yes. So ultimately, it's a question of relevance to like understanding the past to solving the problems for the present and yes. the future. Right? Yeah. What do you mean by relevance? Um, well, why bother understanding it at all? Right. You know, it seems like uh, what we're trying to do is actually create our own ideological structure that we can project onto the past that says, oh, actually, men and women have always been equal, and we can feel, we can stop repeating that trauma in our head and now move forward, you know, which it seems like if you were to look at modern anthropology or like some more contemporary anthropology, you would find a lot of evidence for that that would refute de Beauvoir, you know, in terms of uh, matriarchal right. societies, etc. So the bigger, I mean, I like the question that, you, that you're asking, which is, so why bother doing it at all? And I think it's because it shows us the patterns that otherwise remain totally invisible. Right? So by asking the question, how is it that women fell into, fell into this position of subordination? Was it because they were physically weaker? Was it because they, you know, you know Beauvoir thinks they were like having babies like crazy, which is probably <laughs> not true, right? That probably didn't really happen that way. Um, 
But by asking that question, and even by trying, by using various scientific approaches to try to, to, to prove various cultures, whether they're matriarchal or patriarchal, and how they, how they, you know, she was using Levi Strauss, and she thought, this is, this is example, these are examples of these cultures, and I can show you that this is actually fundamental truth across all cultures, because it's structuralism, and everybody's the same. Um, and so, I think that, A, it shows us, first of all, these patterns, which are legitimate, even if they're not absolute, right? It shows us what we tend to repeat, and how we keep enacting them. It also shows us what we do when we do interpret these patterns. So it shows us what stakes we have when we're making this kind of an interpretation. What stakes does Beauvoir have in saying that there's no such thing as a matriarchal society? She has a stake in that. And so, you know, just as some people, uh, some people would say, well, look, it matters that these matriarchal societies exist, for angles, she's gonna say, it absolutely doesn't exist. So it shows us the stakes involved. And so I think that's useful. And I also just think that it's just sort of um, important to realize that we are unable to not ask the questions about causality. We can't get around, we, we, we don't yet seem to be to this sort of overman position where we can just say a new beginning. Right? I'm the child, it's the you know, sacred yes, and it's the wheel, and we're just we're there, right? We can just we can just start. And we're not there. And so I think it, it, it highlights that as well. So I guess I I love the question because I think that it's it's both really useful to do what I'm suggesting we need to do and also so frustrating. I mean it's the most maddening kind of project to go into these questions of origins that have no answer and wonder why the hell they're doing it in the first place. Did you want to follow up with that at all? Uh, yeah, I have a couple questions. Yeah. What exactly is it that you're suggesting we do? What it, well, I mean, so, I mean, as far as do, you mean the project, or as far as do now that we've done the project? Um, well, you just referenced, you know, that's what's so difficult in terms of exactly what it yeah. is that I'm trying to do. What did you mean by that? Oh, well, I mean, so what I want to say is I like the idea of, of trying to live in a position of ambiguity. And that's a very complex and naughty term with Beauvoir. And so one of the things that I think it's good to do when one is trying to understand what it means to occupy a space of ambiguity is to be able to investigate problems from multiple perspectives. And to actually be able to hold different perspectives as valuable and even perhaps legitimate at the same time, even though they're coming from different places and maybe even making contradictory arguments, right? And I'm saying, if you can actually hold those sorts of dissonances and say, yeah, it's actually kind of that and it's kind of that, even though they're arguing against each other, I think that opens you up to being um, less devoted to a singular truth. Does that make sense? So I'm saying that the strategy that I'm, that I'm looking at with patriarchy by using Freud and Nietzsche and saying, well, is it this way or is it this way? Well, it's both, is a strategy that highlights what I think Beauvoir is talking about with ambiguity and ambiguous life in general, which I think is a good idea to live. You're, you're nodding like, yes, I'm saying um, words, <laughs> but I'm not sure I'm liking those words. <laughs> well, um, so it seems like worrying about Freud and Nietzsche arguing with each other mm -hmm. is sort of like worrying about whether atomists or pluralists are right. When now we're informed by more fine instruments, mm -hmm. I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we find out, well, they're both a little right, they're both a little wrong. You know, conceptually, this is still valuable, but really, this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, so with contemporary anthropology, I really feel like Freud and Nietzsche, both of their ideas about what may have happened are really not valuable anymore, or as useful in the same way. You know, I'm not trying right. to, no, 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 no. I'm in a room full of people who might no, no, shred no, me to pieces totally if I say fair. Freud and Nietzsche aren't valuable anymore, you know, but. Get out of here right <laughs> now. <laughs> you know, no, no, but, I see exactly what you're saying. Uh, right, and I think that kind of goes to, 
an approach that, that happens a lot with historians of philosophy, and, and I don't know if we're allowed to use the word continental philosophy anymore, but people who do continental philosophy, and that is, you know, what, why are we even talking about Freud and Nietzsche, and really, honestly, Beauvoir? And what, what, is the, what is the value to that when we've moved past that and our other philosophies that are certainly going to be much more currently informed on modern bi biology? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 John Hardy. Oh, I did? No. But the point is, is that I, 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 I think that. Um, they're every bit as relevant now as they were then. Okay. And what I think, <laughs> what do you think I'm doing up here, man? <laughs> and I think that um, it's a mistake to sort of treat any one of these theories as just sort of a historical moment that had bad empirical data or mistaken empirical data that we can now um, adjust because whatever empirical data we have now isn't the truth. That's going to, you know, five years from now, 20 years from now, it's going to be totally different too because that's the nature of even our own interpretation of empirical data. So that in itself is always going to be somewhat problematic. So for me, I'm not really as interested in the accuracy. I know, sorry, I'm going all crazy over here. Like, Therefore, I'll say Heidegger and it's all going to go <laughs> But, but I, I think that the way in which we interpret that data is you know, what, which all three of them are doing, right? Here's some data. I mean, and like Nietzsche's just like, I look around, everyone's doing like guilty, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure this out as this kind of primal past. But that interpretation is what I think is useful in us understanding how it is that we continue to interpret our world and the truths in it. So I'm with you. I can totally, I, I take that criticism, and I think it's completely valuable, and, and I see why you would make it, but I'm not as interested in whether or not we can prove now that she was using incomplete, incomplete anthropological data, because of course she was. I mean, it's like it's some of the stuff she says is ridiculous. It's in, I mean, her biology section is so, you know, it's like reading Hegel's Philosophy of Nature and just reading about like Christology and stuff, and you're thinking what? Um, but it's more the interpretation of it. Were you going to say something? I'm a, uh, oh, maybe. Um. <laughs> You kind of answered my question already. Uh, I've always had a difficult time putting together ethic, ethics of ambiguity with second sex. Mm -hmm. and I, your, your talk is really inspiring to me because I think I finally get it now. And that is in those moments in the second sex when she describes woman's place as secondary mm -hmm. as both a cultural and an ontological phenomenon, I, I, I guess I've read too much Sartre to, to because he dismisses the cultural yeah. stuff as merely cultural, whereas right. the ontological, you know, doing a phenomenological ontology gives us the ontology, and culture is just an overlay. Mm -hmm. Whereas she seems to say something that sounds like Levi Strauss, something cultural. There's a structural element to culture, and it determines the lens through which we see the world. Yeah. So is, is there a way in which the ambiguity in the ethics of ambiguity is tied directly to the second sex in that way? Yeah. That that's I, what makes it ambiguous? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, really, I really think, in fact, one of, one of the other things, and I, I'm feeling these two projects, that's what I'm saying. It's like all this, and I think I'm getting this. It's all going to come together. I know it. it's going to be the rug that ties the room together. But <laughs> I think, I think this, the, the structuralism, the structural element, I, I think for her, it, it matters. I think that there are, and I mean, maybe it's, I don't know if it's Merleau Ponty, I don't know if it's like structures yeah. of behavior, I don't know if it's sort of that, but there is a sort of, there are places where she talks about, in both the ethics of ambiguity and the second sex, that there are, although they're not determinate universals, there are these generalizations, these structures that, that seem so ubiquitous that they might as well be conditions, like structuralist conditions. And she'll never say that they are, but we should probably treat them as such so that we can understand the kind of givens that we do come into the world with. And that's why I think the the, the sex gender thing is such a interesting problematic for yeah, her, because she's sure. trying to figure out what does it mean to be a sexed body and have that not determine my essence? Right. Or what right. does it mean to have been this woman in this primal horde and yet that shouldn't mean that women necessarily had to be oppressed by men. And so, yeah, I actually, and, but then of course she, she has the Sartrean element of 
radical freedom. Right. And she she does not I she does not curtail it like Merleau Ponty does. She doesn't say, well, you know, with the most disappointing chapter is the freedom chapter in, in in phenomenology of perception. But for her, yes, always radical freedom. And ambiguity is trying to negotiate that, which doesn't seem negotiable. That you could have these kinds of structures and yet be radically free. And not just in terms of facticity that I transcend, right. but in terms of actually, you know, affecting every aspect of my being in the world. Well, in that sense, she's an advancement on Sartre. I was at a, a uh, discussion where you and Margaret Simons and others were sort of hashing this out, but that's where it, I didn't quite have it figured out at the point. But it, at that point, but it makes me think she's an advancement on Sartre in that sense. She is. Where he's so stuck to the ontology. Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, look, I, Sartre seduced me into philosophy, so I love yeah, the Sartre, too. but me it's too. true. Yeah. You know, at a certain point, you got to let it go. You got to <laughs> sort of see that your privileged position is the only reason that you would be able to make the assertions of radical freedom that you do. And Beauvoir, who really never thought that she was a woman or that she was affected by being a woman and that, oh, I, I had no idea it was a woman because I just was one of the guys, actually had it dawn on her, wow, in fact, I am a woman and that separates me and that makes whatever this Sartrean transcendence is not really the same kind of a thing even though it is human. Well, you're right, and it's not the Merleau-Pontian thing about embodiment right. either. Right, it's it not. not. That's what makes it, I think, so fascinating. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that she's, and that's that's why I think ambiguity, that's what I think she means by ambiguity. It's mm -hmm. it, it's really about trying to, to, to maintain what kind of seems to be contradictory. I mean, at the beginning of Ethics of Ambiguity, she says, your man is a thinking reed. Right? We are stuff, and we're plant-like, and we're vegetative, and, and we're guts, and we think. And it can't be this Cartesian duality. It's so intertwined as to be inextricable, but it's also at odds with itself. So yeah, thank you. That was great. Yeah. I was uh, wondering if you just like clarify a little bit of something for me, because I'm vaguely familiar with um, there was um, sort of assertion in the second sex uh, relating man and woman to Hegel's master-slave dialectic mm -hmm. and how like in some ways it was even like a sort of better representation of that dialectic than master and slave. So um, in, my, in my understanding of the master-slave dialectic, um, Hegel argues that in, the, in certain senses the, uh, it's the slave that has uh, a better sense of or sort of is able to better experience um, a fuller sort of self-realization through the labor he um, right. The labor he does, and like the the ability to sort of see this material change in the world. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, or did, how, did Beauvoir ever say in the Second Sex, like, did she ever make the same comparison of woman, saying that maybe she has a greater sense of self-realization because of the ability to give life and birth, or because it also, from my again vague understanding of Beauvoir's politics and what as kind of reinforced when you explained it, mm -hmm. um, she sort of sees um, the uh, the woman's biology is a sort of burden and a mm -hmm. handicap even, and that you know they won't occupy that ambiguous space, as you were saying, until they can kind of cast off that burden. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, do, is there any point where she sort of makes that argument um, to woman as Hegel does to the slave? Um, well, it's probably like my favorite question to talk about, so I'll try not to say too much. Uh, I think there are two questions, though, that you're asking there. So one is, um, how exactly Beauvoir utilizes Hegel's master-slave dialectic because she does sort of seem to say both things. On the one hand, she says, as I mentioned in the paper, woman bypasses the, the, the master-slave dialectic. She doesn't ever get to in enter into it, and um, that's why there's been no battle, that's why they didn't lose, that's why you can't think of them as slaves who could eventually, throughout history, kind of come to this realization and overthrow their, their, their servitude. She says that. But she also says that the space that women occupy is actually sort of like the perfection of, of, of the slave and the master-slave dialectic. Like they actually occupy the ideal slave position. Um, and I think it's because there's a certain sense in which they are kept in that position without ever having entered into the face-to-face the, the, the -face confrontation, if you will, that Hegelian confrontation. 
Um, and so that's part of the problem as to why they haven't ever overcome it. They've been put into the position that it occupies in Hegel's dialectic mm -hmm. without ever actually entering into Hegel's dialectic. And so that, that, that leads to this really long standing situation of oppression, right? So that's her more metaphysical argument here. That's not really what I'm talking about here, mm -hmm. but I think is so important. And what I think is that the slave um, experiences two things to overcome its servitude. It experiences um, the absolute fear of death, so it, it is reduced to pure negativity because it's the one that blinked and was like, I don't want to die, so please enslave me instead of kill me. And that negativity is what, what self-consciousness is. That is freedom. So it has that implicitly. And uh, work. Right? Work mm -hmm. is the way that the slave overcomes. So those two, th those two experiences are necessary for the slave in order to be the slave and to overcome its servitude. I think the way that Beauvoir talks about women being the absolute other, the absolute negative of man, is actually kind of a way of experiencing that absolute negativity. And that's the way that Beauvoir incorporates that Hegelian element. And so then the other issue would be labor. And she would say, making babies is not labor, and never can be. And would be, a, a, you'd be a tyrannical human being if you thought that making babies, especially gestating babies, mm -hmm. and then educating babies is labor in the sense of other forms of labor, because then you're just a tyrant over another human being, molding them into what you want them to be. So that'll never be the answer. So that's why she says women have to work. So the, the secret is, I think, I mean, there's a long, there's, I'm sorry you asked me that question, because I can talk about it forever. <laughs> so the secret is, uh, I think that the absolute negativity that the slave experiences women have experienced is being, by being the absolute other to man. And now she, that's why she advocates that the second component has to happen. Women have to work. Beauvoir thinks women need to work. So get them out of the house. No more staying in and having babies and calling that equally valid work. <coughs> that is not the kind of work that is needed for liberation. Um, and then there was another question about the body, which I just wrote body. And I have no idea what I'm supposed to say now because I went off on Hegel. <coughs> there was something about, was it, was it maybe about life or, or overcoming the shackles of the body in order to... Oh, uh, yeah, I was just kind of trying to, again, figure in the way she sort of viewed female biology or certain aspects of it as like a sort of burden or a handicap and sort of reconciling that with um, just kind of the earlier part of my question in terms yeah. of how she saw or if she saw women as like sort of more... Uh, realized sort of existentially than man? No, except insofar as I think the idea that kind of gets taken up in, in, later, um, in later feminism about, you know, sort of like that Bell Hooksian marginality, that there is, there is a position of being marginalized, of being the absolute other that gives you a critical distance to see a problem that if you are at the center, but that if you are living it, you're not going to ever think to question. So I think there's that, but I, I don't think that women have have the advantage over men. I think that they're still greatly disadvantaged in insofar as realization of human being. He so said, I like it. Yeah, I'm new to the idea of a dialectic, mm -hmm. but it seems like it's pretty clear that men and women are in some type of dialectical relationship. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, at least in some way, women's production of babies uh, does actually influence their, like their means of mode of production does mm -hmm. influence their relationship with men. Like that seems to be like a relation of production yeah. with a very real outcome yeah. historically. Yes. So it seems silly of de Beauvoir to throw that out in a sense. Yeah. But also um, I think sort of what's missing from all of this, like if, if we're going to say, okay, like we're going to apply these theoretical models to the human past in order mm -hmm. to try and understand it from a position of ambiguity. Mm -hmm. One thing that seems lacking as we talk about the dialectical relationship between men and women is we passed through time up to the present moment that there have been multiple stages in which our material conditions have been different and sort and sort of in a, in a way outside of our dialectical relationship. So like as hunter-gatherers, mm -hmm. men and women occupied different roles of relations of production to each other mm 
than they did in, let's say, or you know, arguably after the Cultural Revolution of 50,000 years ago when they start doing hallucinogens and painting, you know? Mm -hmm. And then uh, again, 12,000 years ago when agriculture occurs, you know, and then through the different religious revolutions that have occurred since then have changed our, rela our physical relations of production to each other in each of those eras that needs to be worked into this conversation. Absolutely. You are completely right about that. And she, I mean, she, she doesn't do it, I think, as fully and robustly as you're going to find in, in Marx and Engels. You're not going to find that kind of, his, that, that grand sweeping historical analysis of how we move from those kinds of societies and those material conditions affect our social interactions. But she takes that as, as given, of course, that the, 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 the contemporary state of uh, material production is going to, to absolutely um, dominate forms of social intercourse. That's, and, and, and the division of labor, as well as um, you know, production and reproduction. She, she's completely on board with that. Uh, I think what you're, so if I, I might have maybe misspoke before. I don't want to say that she doesn't think that the sexual relationship that end between men and women that ends with the production of other human beings isn't relevant. That's totally relevant. That's in fact you know, almost total relevance here in this question. What she doesn't like are the arguments, and I hear this a lot where I teach, so this argument <laughs> is still alive and well, that producing babies is as valuable or even the same kind of production as other forms of labor. And they're not, right? I mean, you know, teaching or educating is, 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 is perhaps something that is, that is a, the other kind of, of, um, of labor that we could talk about. But making babies uh, is not the, a, the sim, a similar kind of, of uh, labor. And that argument has been used, she thinks, to keep women from pursuing other forms of self-actualizing labor. So that's the only point there. Of course it matters. It, it, it's everywhere. It is the thing. That's what she says. Men and women are, are two parts, are cleaved together on, you know, in a mitzine that is given. And they can't, you can't separate society according to sex. Okay, the men are going to go over there and the women are going to go over there. I mean, maybe one day we can, but we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. And that wouldn't even right, be desirable for Beauvoir. So, I don't know do if we, that's... Do we tend to over-romanticize the whole business of making babies in the sense that if... Beauvoir order, thinks so. If in order to <laughs> conceive, you had to abstract the back tooth with no anesthetic, and that, that, that was required for conception, oh, yeah. wouldn't the birth rate collapse to about one... I mean, <laughs> isn't, it, doesn't it, isn't it intuitive that perhaps many, if not the majority of people who were born are kind of not wanted, and so we kind of overvalue huh. the process or underappreciate it or something? Well, I mean, you know, human sexuality, there's a reason why Freud says that right, our sexuality is what makes us human, and so it's not just one of the things that we do, and even Beauvoir will say, yeah, it's pretty much the way in which a human being takes on their sexuality is going to be absolutely fundamental to what that human being or who that human being becomes or is. So sexuality is a big deal. And I think if, you know, babies were made in other ways than in human sexuality, that would totally transform the landscape. But it might not necessarily change or it might not necessarily um, reduce the significance of sexuality to human being. I don't know. You know, it's a big question about the tooth hypothesis, but I think it's a really big deal. We're getting off topic. Yeah, well, you know, it's Friday night. That's going to happen. <laughs> Other questions? We can continue the discussion out uh, here in, in foyer with the refreshments, but let's thank our speaker very much for Thank you all, really. It's so generous of you to share your time on Friday night. That is really nice. <laughs>